Hi everyone, this is Lahiri from ABC's of Anesthesia. And in this little video, I'm gonna go through one of the most common questions that I get asked. Now this question is, what do you do in preparation for your theater list as an anesthetist? So what we're gonna do, we're gonna go through my system, which is essentially the six Ps. These six Ps are personnel and place, as well as patient, procedure, pathology, and overall preparation. So let's get to it. Now the first thing is, as a junior doctor and a junior anesthetist, you really want to get hang of the ropes. So I would always come in early, like literally for most of my career, I come in 15 minutes early to make sure that I could go through all these six Ps. Now the first two are quite easy. You want to know that you've got the right personnel and you're, and you're familiar with the environment, which you generally will be because you'll get an orientation. So I don't worry too much about personnel in place unless I'm going to a new hospital altogether. The next few things, the next four Ps are very important and apply every day. And these are patient, procedure and pathology, as well as overall preparation. So with patient, it's really easy. Even before the patient arrives, I wanna make sure that I'm there early and I can review the medical records. And often this is looking at the EMR or the electronic medical record or looking at the paper record and just filling out an anesthetic chart. That way I've got an idea of exactly what's gonna happen and at least an overall idea of how this patient might be before I actually talk to the patient. So that's the first thing and that's, that's pretty straightforward. It just requires a bit of diligence and you can look at my website, anesthesiacollective.com for a few different patient assessment performers. The next thing is pathology. So again, the night before, even in the morning of your list, make sure you know what's going on. So sometimes it's gonna be something really straightforward, such as a lap collar. You don't really need to do too much research into this, but let's say you're gonna be doing a liver resection for some carcinoid tumor or some other you know, weird pathology, you wanna be sure that you've got all of that covered, that you've read the notes, you've read the latest review articles. And for example, one of the greatest resources I found was the British Journal of Anesthesia Education Series, and they go through some amazing, very focused articles on all the specific pathologies that anesthetists really need to worry about. And this includes everything from you know, thyroid to pheochromocytomas, maybe medical conditions like rheumatoid arthritis or other different types of procedures like liver operations, AAA repairs, or any other you know, advanced or subspecialty anesthetic cases. Now let's talk about procedure. Again, once you get used to the day in day out of most surgeries, you'll be very familiar with what a lap collie needs or what an inguinal hernia repair needs from an anesthetic point of view. But as soon as I see the surgeon or the surgical registrar, I always have a conversation with them. And what this means is I ask them all the common things. How long is this gonna take? Is there any expected blood loss? What antibiotics do you need? Do you need DVT prophylaxis? And do you need anything else special? For example, where do you wanna position the arms? This has a lot to do with where I'm gonna put the drip for the case. Now you'll get very comfortable with asking these questions and I think it's a really great thing to you know, have a conversation with the surgeon. You know, that way you get to have a chat with them before something crazy happens and you just get into conversational mode so that you can get a lot of useful information really quickly. So the things I want to know about the procedure, the duration, any expected blood loss, where is the surgeon expected to position the patient, especially are the arms out or are they in, as well as do you need antibiotic prophylaxis, DVT prophylaxis, and then there's always some particular special instruments or gadgets that the surgeon might need. For example, ENT surgery or airway surgery, you might wanna ask what airway specifically do you need? Um, do you need a throat pack? Do you need a special neuromuscular monitoring tube such as a NIM tube for thyroid surgery? or maybe you're expecting a lot of blood loss and do you think a cell save might be appropriate? There's a lot of other nuances to this and that's for definitely advanced level training, but at the very start, I have a conversation with the surgeon about their needs. Finally, there's overall preparation. And in my ABCs of Anesthesia Bootcamp playlist that you can find in the playlist on this channel, you'll see a whole bunch of stuff to do with checklists. Uh, and so my checklist in the morning is always the 4Ms checklist and this is machine, monitoring, Mables, that's M-A-B-E-L-S, Mables, and that's airway equipment, and finally medications. So those are some of the things we're gonna go through. So let's start with the first M, and this is machines. So these fancy machines are really great. For example, usually in the morning, my nurses are fantastic. They already go through the integrated checklist and the full machine test that is automated. Back in the old days, you'd have to do it this manually, but these days on the new machines, you can literally press this button, full test, and then it goes through a full checklist. I might do that in another video. What I do is I literally go to show log and make sure that all of these things have been passed. For example, ventilating gas passed on this date with a leak that's okay. So it's less than 100 mils, generally up to 250 mils is okay. If it's greater than 250 mils, you really wanna to talk to your supervisor. 
A circuit lease has been passed. Again, the date is today's date and it's less than 100, so that's fantastic. And now the low pressure leaks are often done uh, once a week or so, but again, this is, has all been passed and it's fine. What I do then is, I, even though I know that the machine check has been done, I make sure that a few other things are also really good. For example, I go around to the back of the machine to make sure that I have a self-inflating Liddell bag or a bag mask valve. And this means that if this machine was to stuff up in any way, it's a very complicated device. It's, you know, with a couple hundred thousand dollars at least, you can still do most of the essential functions, which is positive pressure ventilation with a Liddell bag. So if something went really wrong with this machine, the Liddell bag would be absolutely fine for this. So that's the first thing. So I make sure that the machine's been checked and I have a Liddell bag. Let's go on to Mabel's. So Mabel's, M-A-B-E-L-S, stands for masks. So I check that I've got a mask and, it's, and I've got also a range of sizes. It's usually in one of the drawers. And see here, I've got a range of sizes of masks that can fit pretty much any face. A is for airways, so I'm just making sure that I have Goodell's airways. Again, we'll go through this in a later airway talk um, that I'll upload soon, and also nasopharyngeal airways. Finally, LMAs in a range of sizes, and again, kept in the drawer, usually there's a three, four, and five LMA. B is for bougie, now this, you can get these really fancy bougies that look like this, or you can just get the normal ones, which look like this. And this, this bougie or a stilette is fantastic when it comes to you know, managing difficult airways. So that's all sorted. E is for ETT. Again, I look in the drawer and make sure I've got a range of ETTs and sizes. A six, seven, eight size tube is usually what I need. L is for laryngoscope. And this device is absolutely essential, obviously, for, for intubating to getting that airway exposure to put the tube down into the trachea. I make sure I have two laryngoscope blades, a size three and four Mac blade. I just make sure without touching the blade that this is working, you know, that the light is working, which you might be able to see through there, that it's working just fine. Again, I check both of these because you definitely want this to work when you need it and having the light out or the battery blown or the bulb blown is, uh, you know, just a really difficult situation to deal with. Finally, suction. So I make sure that my suction is on maximum and then I just check through here that it's working. You can hear that sound. And if I was to put my hand on the end of that, it would show me that the suction was working because you'd feel some traction on the skin. Put that safely away. So that's Mabel's, M-A-B-E-L-S. Next, I go to monitoring. So monitoring, this machine here has so many different measurements that it takes, especially with ventilator alarms and pressure alarms, apneic alarms. But really the essential things I need in any situation are a SATS probe, a blood pressure cuff, ECG and end tidal CO2. So if I look over here in this particular machine, here I've got a SATS probe, here I've got the blood pressure tubing and a cuff will be present. And then I've got the ECG leads here. And finally, end tidal CO2 is already attached to my mask. And that then leads up this wire through some sidearm sampling all the way to this connection over here. And as soon as I've got that on the patient, it will receive a signal which shows that I've got end tidal CO2 just along this trace here. So that's my monitoring. The absolute essentials I'd need is saturation probe, blood pressure cuff, ECG dots for you know ECG monitoring of the heart rhythm, and then end tidal CO2. And I can go into those in another video. Finally, I go over to my trolley. Now medications, these are absolutely vital obviously, now, the way I think about this is, there's obviously a lot of medications I need in anesthesia, but the ones I need in an emergency are my SPA drugs, SPAAA. So first of all, I need a fast acting relaxant, and here it is, succinamethonium, or even high dose rocuronium at 1.2 milligrams per kilogram. I need propofol, which is here, and then I need atropine, adrenaline, and aramine and ephedrine. So just to go through those, Here's atropine, make sure I've got that. Again, every drawer is different depending on which hospital you work at. I've got aramine, which is the trade name for metaraminol, which is just here. And there's another type of aramine in, in, that's concentrated in a vial and adrenaline over here in different concentrations. I always think of ephedrine as well because that is like adrenaline, but just not as potent and much easier to use in more, most anesthetic circumstances. Now those medications are obviously really important for a number of reasons. Now, the reason I chose my spa drugs or SUCS, propofol, atropine, adrenaline, aramine versus all the other drugs is because these drugs are so vital 
in the most emergent situations. For example, if a patient has laryngospasm or is fighting the ventilator or something serious happens, a rapid acting muscle relaxant can really help an anesthetist solve those problems. Again, these drugs are not to be given by a junior, junior practitioners or ones who are not experienced and should always be done with supervision. So a muscle relaxant, absolutely vital uh, to solve a lot of your problems. P is for propofol, and again, propofol deepens the anesthetic, make sure that your patient is asleep and can treat all things like a patient moving as well as hypertension. And again, you'll see one of our medications videos which goes into that in a bit more detail. Now, often with anesthetics, especially in kids, hypoxemia can cause bradycardia and atropine is a solution for that. And there's a lot of different vagal type stimuluses that can happen during an operation bezel jaris reflexes, bagel reflexes, and these can cause very severe bradycardias and even, even asystole. So having atropine ready to go is absolutely vital. Adrenaline is probably the most common sense emergency drug you need because any time a patient is close to rest, peri-arrest or even arrest, you need to give that dose. It's a treatment for arrest, it's a treatment for peri-arrest, it's a treatment for vena dilation, vasodilation, as well as poor contractility. And adrenaline is a fantastic treatment for anaphylaxis, increasing that central blood volume distribution through vasoconstriction, but also inhibiting mast cells that degranulate all that histamine everywhere. Finally, aramine and ephedrine. These are the most common medications that you use on a day-to-day -day basis after the induction of anesthesia. Because as we know, giving propofol and another drug for induction causes venodilation and vasodilation. And the easiest thing to do there is give it a small dose of aramine or metaraminol, and that just tightens the veins and the arteries to improve your perfusion. Likewise, occasionally, sometimes your patient just doesn't have great contractility. Maybe you've, you've given some medications, some beta blockers, or maybe the induction itself has caused the heart just not, just not to function as well. Now, there's some occasions where you need to use ephedrine. Now, ephedrine has more you know, inotropy and beta effects than alpha effects, whereas aramine or metaraminol does veno and vasoconstriction ephedrine does a bit of venoconstriction and vasoconstriction, but also is a positive inotrope. And that's absolutely fantastic when you have a patient who might not have a very good heart, maybe they've got poor contractility or a poor injection fraction, or you've given a bit too much anesthetic and you just need to improve the heart function. So aramine and ephedrine, really, really commonly used and very important drugs in this situation. So obviously there's a lot of other medications that you need for an anesthetic, but these are the absolute vital ones that you need. So hopefully that's helped. We've gone through the six Ps. Firstly, place and personnel, only really relevant if you're in a new hospital. And then the other Ps, which is patient and making sure you've done that provisional assessment, we've talked about the procedure, and we've talked about the pathology and making sure you've read up on that and talked to the surgeon about those things. And finally, your overall preparation, which is your four Ms, and that's Mabel's, machine, medications, and monitoring. So I hope you enjoyed this video. If you have any questions, please ask them in the comments below and I'll see you guys next time. Thanks very much.